Jim Morrison is a god. A god who thought my breasts looked like mushrooms. <laughs> This is not a weird prequel to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. This is that 80s show. This seemed like a logical follow-up to Fox's largely successful primetime sitcom, That 70s Show. However, Fox's hopes and dreams for lightning to strike twice in the same exact place were quickly dashed, and the show was cancelled after airing only 13 episodes. So what happened here? With such a clear roadmap to creating a successful, nostalgia-saturated sitcom sitting right in front of their faces, how did Fox drop the ball this hard? When spinoffs are created, they usually go one of two ways. They either copy their parent series to the letter, we've seen a lot of successes here with countless NCISs and Law and & Orders. Spinoffs also find great success in doing something completely different with a popular character, like Mork & Mindy, Laverne & Shirley, Frasier, or even The Jeffersons. Where shows usually fail is when they try to do both of these things at the same time. So. Today, we're going to be trying to take a look at that 80s show and how trying to do two things at once can sink a spin-off series in just a few short months. That 70s show aired in 1998 and ran for over 200 episodes until it was cancelled in 2006. To this day, it is one of the longest-running sitcoms in Fox's television history. In fact, the show ran for so long it became a joke amongst the producers that they were eventually going to have to start calling it That 80s Show. As it would turn out, that joke would eventually become reality, and production on That 80s Show began in August of 2001. There was an interview conducted by The Daily Advertiser featuring one of That 80s Show's producers, Linda Wallum, in which she stated that the showrunners had been talking about what they had been doing in the 80s and found that they had all been in pretty much the same situation, which was supporting themselves with jobs they hated but really burning to be in show business. She added that they created these characters as people who are constantly being pulled between their artistic dreams and commercial reality. Having this understanding about how the show was created almost makes it seem as if the show was written from a place of bitterness and frustration towards the era, and it definitely bleeds into the show's overarching themes. Let me guess, a Cindy Lauper lookalike contest? I think you've got a lock on it. <laughs> That's so mean! You must be Tuesday! You see, that 80s show was not a spin-off, despite being marketed as such. Rather than continue the storyline of that 70s show, that 80s show would sort of serve as a distant cousin to its predecessor. We mean that quite literally, as the spin-off was centered around this guy, Corey Howard, played by It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia star and co-creator Glenn Howerton. Corey Howard was introduced as Eric Foreman's cousin. This would be the only real connection made to the show's predecessor. The rest of the cast was filled in with characters who felt more like satirical representations of various 80s cliches rather than fully fleshed out human beings. It's not the strangest move for a sitcom spin-off to diverge from its predecessor entirely. Frasier did this with great success. The Cheers spinoff ran for 264 episodes and received over 107 Emmy Awards and nominations. The difference is, Frasier was a completely standalone series and its own identity. It wasn't called Cheers 2, Frasier Moves to Seattle, nor was it marketed as such. It was clearly defined as its own show, and while there are subtle nods back to Cheers here and there, it was a completely separate entity in its story and tone. Just naming the show That 80s Show cemented the idea that this show is going to be a direct spinoff of That 70s Show in the minds of the viewers. In utilizing this name convention, Fox was essentially making a promise to its viewers that they never intended on fulfilling. The promise being, hey, we're continuing the show that you loved, only they weren't. They were creating something completely different and expecting it to yield the same results. There's a saying that goes something to the effect of, happiness is reality minus expectations. And it rings true to the fans of any entertainment property. When our expectations are set at a certain level and are never met, we become dissatisfied. Our viewing experience becomes wholly negative, and our capacity of maintaining a vested interest depletes at a rapid pace. From a writing perspective, that 80s show uses the same formula that 70s show used, but where that 70s show uses tropes and cliches from its titular era as an aesthetic to add to an already rich story about friendship, love, maturation, and the struggles of navigating early adulthood. Oh, Red! Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that 80s show uses them to drive pretty much every aspect of the show. Here, I got this for you. Oh, Jägermeister! <laughs> misunderstood. It's really a digestive aid. That 70s show relied on creating comedy through relationships and drama. You think I like being stuck here, nursing my lunatic wife back from the brink? 
hell no. Whereas that 80s show seems to go for the low hanging fruit at almost every opportunity. Wow, you're shallow. I'm not shallow. You're right, I'm sorry. You're more of a hypocrite. The characters are written without any depth whatsoever. Characters are the fuel of every sitcom's engine. Sitcoms very seldomly break the mold as far as storylines go, where a film like Star Wars can rely on a truly unique world to highlight an otherwise run-of-the-mill character's choices, a sitcom must rely on their truly unique character's choices to highlight an otherwise run-of-the-mill world. In that 80s show, everyone just exists within the most simplified version of a stereotype you could possibly imagine, where normally we'll have a compelling lead who seems vulnerable and sincere, Corey is written as a whiny, petulant Gen Xer who is trying to hook up with his co-worker. I'm pretty sure my girlfriend dumped me for a woman. Happens. My music career is not a career. Happens. And my hip dad wants me to get in the game. The character of Sophia is almost immediately introduced as a bisexual, and after that, her entire character is just centered around being bisexual and trying to manipulate Corey's sister, Katie, into a romantic relationship. Well, I can't get the lady to want me. Then I'll get the lady's man to want the lady to want me. Even the father figure, played by Jeff Pearson, is a stereotype of a creepy divorced dad who hates his ex-wife. Oh, hold on a minute, I'll ask. Are you using the timeshare in Rosarito? Why, does she need someplace quiet to go and count my money? It seems like there was an intentional shift to create these characters in complete contrast to the characters on That 70s Show. While this move is understandable for the perspective of wanting to provide something new for an audience, it doesn't work when you're trying to walk in the same exact footsteps as the show you're spinning off of. These characters have completely different attitudes, personalities, perspectives, and philosophies, yet the writers keep trying to force them into the same roles and relationships as the characters from a completely unrelated show. There was heart, warmth, and vulnerability to the character of Eric Foreman that just isn't present with Corey Howard. Despite the inherent tokenization of a quirky character portrayed by an underrepresented minority in both that 70s show and that 80s show, Fez's overdramatic, gullible, lover-not-a-fighter persona was at least made in an attempt to humanize a character that would have otherwise felt like they were straddling the line between xenophobia and racism. Oh, please. I'm a hard-looking, smooth-talking, frisky-ass son of a bitch. This wannabe yuppie character of Roger Park was never really given any development beyond the fact that he lives in an attic, wants to have sex, and can't. A steady chicken holidays equal nothing but cash. <laughs> and I ain't about that, bro. The point here is by flipping the script on essentially every character they possibly could, they inadvertently flipped the script on the chemistry between those characters that made them work so well. None of those characters seem to make sense together. Their relationships never click, everything feels sort of forced, dirty, and mean-spirited. That 80s show was marketing itself to an audience who had already proven that they relate to everything this show was not. It was almost insulting to fans of the original series, and that 80s show lost its target demographic very, very quickly. From the first to the final episode, that 80s show lasted for an entire five months. Now, it was recently announced that Netflix acquired the rights to produce a new spinoff titled That 90s Show, and it seems promising. The show follows the Foreman family from That 70s Show, and a good chunk of the original cast is returning. That 80s Show should have worked. By all means, it probably could have worked. The creative team needed to either copy That 70s Show to the letter and just put it under an 80s aesthetic, or do something entirely different. Unfortunately, the decision was made to try and do both of those things at the same time, which ultimately resulted in a finished product that felt like it wasn't exceeding at any of those things. It failed to recreate the magic of That 70s Show, which was the show's heart relatability and focus on positive relationships. On the other side of the same coin, it also failed to be unique in any way, shape, or form, relying on cheap sexual humor and pointed references to 80s pop culture to hopefully drive its comedy through the seemingly eternal 22 minutes of each episode's runtime. Thankfully, it didn't last very long. Some of these episodes are available to watch online, and they might be worth a rewatch if you view the show as a fun framing device for how Dennis Reynolds became a monster. We don't want wild girls. We want real girls going wild. But aside from that, the show's minuscule 13 episode run was completely warranted. And well, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please like and subscribe to Nerdstalgic if you haven't done so already. You might see a couple links to related videos floating around in your player here, so feel free to click any of those if you want to stick around. And thanks for watching Nerdstalgic.